Hello YouTube. If you are into fitness even a tiny bit, at some point or the other you have heard the name of Arnold to the point that we no longer use his last name because there's only one. The guy is a mythological figure at this point, he's the Pope of bodybuilding and some of us, some men from the previous generation even have grown up with the dude as their inspiration and role model. And so his word has been taken for gospel for many many years, his advice was followed religiously by many many people. But with the internet has come a new wave of skepticism and you now have men of my generation who point out that actually Arnold might have been a complete idiot and his training advice might actually be very very bad. And some of that could be just for clickbait because of course it's always very very popular to try and take down an idol but I also think that there is some value in this criticism and some of it is actually justified. So what I want to do today is I want to separate le grain de livret. I want to separate the clickbait from the genuine bullshit that Arnold was peddling onto people, especially natural lifters, in order to make you, the viewer, know what you should follow and what really doesn't hold up to today's standards. Starting with the most egregious of Arnold's misconduct, his form. You might have seen these shorts or these clickbait videos of influencers who tell you Arnold's form was garbage, his form was even potentially dangerous. And this is the part that I personally disagree with the most and where there is the most to learn because we'll see that the people who create that, that type of attack against Arnold seem to not understand what constitutes proper form for bodybuilding. Let's start for example with Arnold's cable row, the one that people like to point out as being horrible because when he did his cable rows, Arnold would round his back, he would do them with a rounded back with a ton of body English. And these guys will tell you no, this is horrible, a proper cable, cable row is done with a straight back and with your arms, only the arms moving back and forth, a cable row. Here's the funny thing. The technique that these people try to sell as proper is actually the worst way possible to do a cable row for a very simple reason that we can explain by looking at the human body. If you fix your back and you remain static and most importantly you fix your shoulders and they remain static and you move back and forth, what really happens? Well, what happens is that you are going to get a ton of brachioradialis meaning that the muscles that are going to move the stack are going to be the, the muscles of the arm. Why? Because they're the only ones that move. So now you have taken a cable row that is a, an exercise for the back, for the trapezius and the lats and you have turned it into a bastardized version of bicep isolation. That is really not what the lift was intended for. Meanwhile, if you allow the shoulders to protrude forward, if you allow the back to round, now the main mover of the movement is going to be the musculature of the back, which is exactly what Arnold does. So this is a perfect example of people who don't understand that proper form doesn't mean pretty, it doesn't need to look nice and if you have to move the body through space and have the spine round a bit to engage the muscles you want to engage then that is perfectly fine because understand that in, in, in back movements for bodybuilding scapular protraction, so the action of rounding the shoulders forward to allow the back to stretch is more important than retraction. Sure, the retraction at the end to get the squeeze is valuable, but if you maintain that retraction throughout the movement, you prevent the muscles of the back from actually being challenged, which is crazy if you think about it, because for years the advice shoulders back was super popular. I remember as a young man starting my journey, my fitness journey, and looking at all of these influencers telling me, oh, when you do your rows, shoulders back. When you do any movement for the lat, shoulders back. Shoulders back? That is the exact opposite cue that you should be giving people because that is the cue that prevents me from feeling my back. And then you end up with a generation of dudes who say, I don't understand, I can't engage my lats. Well, no duh, it's because you've been taught the wrong way. So Arnold was actually correct all along. Now, I would say that maybe his body English and his spinal flexion was a bit over-exaggerated. I would never go into that deep of a stretch, 
That being said, if you do your kerbal rows, it's perfectly normal that your back is going to stop being straight and that your thoracic spine is going to round forward because you're going to allow, again, the back to stretch. Don't stress out, that is actually proper form. The one thing that would turn it into a cheat movement while you're using the wrong type of body English is if the movement comes from the hips. So if your back does a pendulum motion, or well now the movement that is pulling the stack is the weight of the torso being pulled backwards, this is when you know you're doing something wrong because now you're doing an actual row. If you've ever seen someone row in a boat, you'll know and you'll notice that they don't use only their backs. They use their legs, they use their entire body weight. Why? Because their goal is not to get jacked, it's to get the boat to move faster. So they will do that pendulum motion. And in their case, it's justified, they're not trying to get jacked. But in your case, it's not good. So that is the one caveat that I would actually insist on. Then we have the T-bar row, and the T-bar row is even worse because you're standing up. So when you have that footage of Arnold, who bends all the way forward, almost touching his toes with his lumbar spine fully rounded, people freak out because we have been told for a long time to not do that. Here is the thing. That is also an issue of proper versus pretty because your body is able to get into these positions. And so if you do allow that amount of thoracic rounding, as long as the posterior chain is engaged, this is not really dangerous. And two, it's going to allow you to get a lot of stretch. This is actually perfectly okay to perform your rows in that fashion as long as you're aware of that fact. As long as you keep in mind that yes, doing them like this is going to fatigue your erectors, it's going to put some load on your, on your lumbar spine and your lower back, then you are going to be okay. Because once these factors are taken into account, then they are protecting you in a sense because now you are in control. It would be completely different if you attempted to do a deadlift through that technique technique just to get the weight up, a cat back deadlift. In that case, I would say, yeah, that is detrimental. But in a row, you're going to use a much lesser load and the goal and the focus is still going to be on that scapular protraction at the bottom because it's technically still an upper back exercise. But by doing it in this fashion, you get a more total stimulus. So if you program that type of row as more of a total back workout, like a proper row should be programmed, in my humble opinion, then you are absolutely good. The deficit T-bar row was a favorite of bodybuilders from back then for that reason, because it stretches the entire back. It's only going to be tough to access for people who like the mobility. If you don't have the mobility for such a movement, then yes, your SI joint and your lumbar spine might suffer. But if you walk towards it, you might actually fall in love with the lift. The only thing I would say to not copy when it comes to Arnold Star is the touch and go. Because the touch and go steals parts of the stretch. When you bounce a weight from the floor, that bounce is supposedly is was supposed to be taken care for by the muscles of the back. And now you are essentially cheating and not the right type of cheating because you're leaving pounds on the table, pounds that should go towards the muscle growth. So this is a technique miscue, I would say, that I can point out and say, yeah, that is not the best, don't do that. But outside of it, for now, our node is still pristine and the lab pull down is only going to confirm that. If you look at the way he did his pull down, some people might say, well, that's not proper because he's not keeping the bar exactly in the axis, axis of the spine and there's too much dynamic motion of the body. Absolutely. That is because he's doing his lat pull down in a specific style. That is not my style. I like to stay much more vertical to keep a pure vertical pull. And I also like a much slower tempo. But bringing the bar or any implement you're using for your lat pull downs in that, in that matter to the chest. So bending the back backward and actually looking up at the lat pull down as you do the exercise is perfectly valid as well. It's going to give you a slightly different stimulus and you're also going to be able to use more weight. The key in that case is understanding why you do it. If you do it just because you want to pull the full stack, then you're an idiot and you're not going to get the results that you want. But if you look at Arnold doing it, you see that he is in control throughout the motion. And most importantly, he allows the stack to stretch the lats 
at the end of the negative, which is what you want from the exercise. Always with a free-flowing free scapula. So the scapula is not remaining static because the function of the scapula is to be dynamic throughout back movement. So when the arms elevate, it's going to outwardly rotate and it's going to allow the arms to push upwards, which is the function of the entirety of this muscle group. This is what you want. I keep seeing people who in the gym cut the range of motion short when they pull the arm. Oftentimes because they lack the scapular mobility and that is fine, you want to build up to it. But the goal, just like in a pull-up, should be to be able to extend the arm as high as possible above your head while keeping the lats engaged. Of course, if the lats disengage and the shoulders start to take over and they start to internally rotate, you want to stop the movement. But in Arnold's footage, that never happens. The second the lats reach maximum stretch and maximum tension, he pulls back down. That is actually textbook form. This is the way you should be doing your lat pull downs if your goal is growth. And cueing the lat pull down in that fashion is also going to teach you how to pull with your back. When I see noobs who pull here from the elbow, that is not a back exercise. It's a bicep isolation exercise, a good one if you know how to do it. But an actual proper lat pull down requires this. It does require the shoulder joint to move. And so the cue of bringing the bar to the chest is really a dangerous one because if you try that with people who lack the mobility, you'll see that oftentimes the way they try and do it is they try to inwardly rotate at the shoulder and they elevate their elbow like this because they try to forcibly bring that bar down. That's not proper. You should just think, try to squeeze the scapula together. If you're limited and you have to stop here because you're too weak, that's perfectly okay. That range of motion and that mobility will be built through resilience and through strength. The one criticism I would have for this footage of Arnold is the fact that he seems to stop way before failure actually occurs. He seems to stop at like reps in reserve three. You can really grind your ass out on that pull downs. It's not dangerous at all. You can even squeeze out additional negatives. I think the reason why he didn't do it is because he had a much more voluminous approach to training as we'll discuss later. And so it's less important for him to take every set to failure because he does so many sets. But if you're like me and you do three to six sets per muscle groups or per exercise per day, you really want to make every set count. So you really want to get as many reps as possible. So that's for the back. These tend to be the big ones that people like to point out to make fun of Arnold's form and these people are just dead wrong. If anything, their attempt at demystifying Arnold and breaking down the myth is misguided because then they go on to give bad advice to beginners who are trying to build these lats. But Arnold wasn't really known for his back, he was known for his chest and his shoulders. So let's see what his form on these exercises looked like. So many people, many men, have taken the fly pill from Arnold because Arnold believed that by doing heavy flies with dumbbells, you would open up your chest. That is, in a sense, a bit of bro science because no amount of flies is going to reattach the tendons of your pecs to make them wider. Arnold had a crazy chest because his insertions were godlike. You might have shit insertions like me. I insert very high here and so I have a boob. My pec is not square, it's round. That is genetics, there's nothing you can do about it. But flies are still going to help you build that lower portion of the pec and they feel good. They can also help with mobility of the, th the thoracic cage. So they are actually a good exercise as long as you do them properly. And we see that Arnold clearly knows his shit because when he does his flies, he keeps his elbows at around a 90 degree with the humerus. You often see people who tell young men to open up their elbow when they do flies. Because that way you get a greater distance between the mover and the, the weights. And that is sound advice if you want to get more out of less weight. The issue is that by doing this, you create a weakness vacuum. Because now you open a segment that is weakening the entire body. Instead, you really want to keep that elbow close to you. That way you can open at the chest and you can use more weight and get a better stretch overall. Do not think that by opening that elbow, you magically get more work for the chest. That's not true at all. You are just going to end up with a lesser load and a higher chance of overuse injury. But it shouldn't be too hard to convince you to stick to the 
power form of the fly because it also allows you to use heavier dumbbells. And as we all know, that is the greatest way to seduce men. Then we have the movement for the shoulder, and it's one that I've propagated on the channel years ago, the power raise. A movement that is not often seen in gyms. I've actually never seen a single person done it in the gym where I go to. But that is a great shoulder isolation mo movement for the side delt. Because it's as close to pure isolation for that part of the delt as possible. And on top of that, the stretch at the bottom is crazy. You see, with things like a cable lateral raise, which is a great exercise that I love, it's S-tier. I would argue that the stretch that you get throughout the negative is not maximized because at some point or the other, your arm is going to run into your body. And so the stretch just dies. Meaning that at the bottom of that range of motion, the muscle of the delt is not under tension at all. It's purely relaxed. With the power raise, it's not the case. It's at, at peak tension, quote unquote, at peak stretch at the end of that negative, because that's where you rebound from. So it's actually an exercise that you have to be careful with because it can be dangerous. You can potentially detach something in the shoulder. But if you build up to it, you'll find that it's very easy to cheat safely. So to get these additional reps. And on top of that, if you're the type of person who loves their lengthened partials, this movement has lengthened partial written all over it because it's super easy to squeeze these extra negatives at the end of your set. It's not going to damage your performance. It's going to just be pure volume for that side dart. So that's another win for Arnold. Five wins in a row. And the Arnold critiques, the Arnold naysayers and haters are going to have to eat crow because they're wrong. Maybe there are exercises that I haven't seen from the guy where he is just full of shit. It's Arnold we're talking about, so of course these exercises exist. But for these ones, I have to give him the W. Then we're going to move on to part two, where I'm finally going to be able to criticize the guy. Because it doesn't really matter how well you do the exercises, if the structure that puts them in place is garbage, then the exercises are not going to give you the result that you want. So now we're going to focus on Arnold's famous bodybuilding program, the Blueprint to Mass. That program might be the most famous bodybuilding program of all time. There are generations of men that run that run it as their first bodybuilding program, which is terrifying because when you look at it, holy fuck the amount of volume, holy fuck the amount of sets. I think I would have died if, as a young man, I attempted to do this. It is way too much. At first glance, I can already tell you that. Je mets la charrue avant les bœufs. I'm putting the horse before the carriage. First, we have to look at the structure. So, unlike what some people think or say, the blueprint to mass is not a bro split. The blueprint to mass is an upper lower split. And that is verifiable by a simple click. I'm going to go and look at the structure. On Monday, you do chest, back and abs. So that's upper. On Tuesday, shoulders, biceps, triceps, forearms, abs. So that's upper. Then you do Wednesday, legs, calves, abs, lower. Thursday, chest, back and abs. Upper, Friday, shoulders, biceps, triceps, arms, abs. Upper, Saturday, legs, calves, and abs. Lower. You could argue it's a body part split. In a sense, this is extremely similar to the way I program because this looks like a gentleman split. It's high frequency training and it's, it's based on the skeleton of an upper lower with these slight specificities. So just looking at this, if you like to train every single day with only one rest day, that looks good. That looks good to me because you have technically two upper days focused on the push. So the muscles of the torso, back included, of course, part of the torso. You have two arm days, so you will not end up with a spider physique with this. And then you have two leg days, so it's extremely balanced and you will get a complete physique from this. We also see that we train abs every single day which might be a bit overkill, but shit, at least we train abs on this. Modern bodybuilding programs oftentimes don't even include that muscle group that is super important for an aesthetic physique. Then you also have calves. So calves are included. You have forearms, a program with forearms. The only thing missing is neck, and that is normal. No one really trained neck back then, or maybe I couldn't find programs that included neck, but they disregarded it because they didn't think it was important at all. So that's for the things that at first glance look to be positive. Then there is the immediate negatives and the first one is the rep range. So the rep ranges are weird and all over the place. The way the program works is you go through phases. So one week you'll do a certain exercise and another week you'll do another exercise. 
that is already not that great in my opinion because that type of fluctuation is going to lead to low specificity, which might be a problem at some point, but we'll talk about that later. It's because Arnold believed in shocking the muscle. What shocks me personally and what shocks my muscles right now is these fucking rep ranges because on some of them, you have something that makes sense. So sometimes it's like 12 to six, which is a perfectly respectable rep range. It's an evolving rep range. Then you have something like an eight to two. How do you justify that fork? 8 to 2, what weight is going to have you go from 8 reps to 2? You would be forced to add weight. For me, if my 8 rep max is 100 pounds, let's say, and I do a second set of that, I'll get 7 or 6, never less. And then maybe on the third set, I'll get 5, but I will never go down to 2. So that's already weird and questionable. Then you have 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, so the, an, essential, an essentially a 5 by 5, which is not a reference that I like, but at least it's straightforward and it gets the job done. Where I really raise an eyebrow is the 20 to 12 rep range, because now we're starting to get into high volume territory, high reps for high sets, because it's one thing to do two sets of 20. But if you do four, six, eight, that multiplies quick. That's a shitload of reps. And we'll see that this is really the problem with the upper portion of Arnold's blueprint to mass. There's too much volume coming from you from every angle. And keep in mind that you are going to do these exercises for the same muscle group. So you'll do flat barbell bench press, incline barbell bench press, and some dumbbell flies. Now, technically you could tell me, well, it's only three exercises for the chest. Yeah, but if we go back to the frequency, you're going to do that on Monday, you're going to do that on Thursday, and you're going to do a lot of reps for every single one of these sets, plus supersets that come out of nowhere because Arnold wants you to do your dumbbell flies superset with dumbbell pullovers. And the dumbbell pullover is also going to work your chest. So to me, that would make sense for someone who's enhanced, but I don't see how someone who is not enhanced would recover from this. Right now, I'm reading it off of some fucking bodybuilding forum, and from what I know, from years of reviewing programs, most often times, we are given programs that are not written as intended, and not programmed as intended. So I'm going to assume competency on Arnold's part, and I'm going to just say, okay, this is the way it's supposed to, to be done. So you superset your chest and your back movements. And if that's the case, that's fine. The back movements are wide grip chin-ups, and then you superset them with rows, dumbbell rows, and T-bar rows. Again, four exercises for the back on a given day, even three would be a bit too much. And that really materializes when we look at the day you are supposed to train shoulders, which is Tuesdays and Fridays, where you're going to do a clean and press, Superset with dumbbell press and front uh, frontal raise. Superset with lateral raise and upright rows. One, these supersets are going to kill you because they're training the exact same muscles of the shoulder that are already small. They already have a low work capacity and a low recovery ability. So you're literally just moving weight for the sake of moving weight with no actual result. And then when you look at all of the exercises you're doing, is it really necessary to do that many isolation movements? I think that for most natural lifters, you would want to do one to two isolation movements for shoulders on any given day you train shoulders with one big vertical press, maybe two, but that is it. You don't want to expand beyond that. However, I must say that it's quite refreshing to see an arm day that contains so many compounds because you also have some close grip bench going on in there. So the structure of the arm day is significantly better than the structure of the chest day. But the thing that made me laugh is the fact that out of all the days in Arnold's program, the best ones are the leg days. So the guy was famous for his upper body. And for some reason, the ones that are programmed, the days that are programmed properly are the ones that have nothing to do with it. So his leg days, for example, have you do some squats, some straight leg deadlifts, some lunges and some leg extensions. That's perfect. That's all you need. You don't need more than that. You don't need... 15 exercises for the quads, one big movement for the quads, one big movement for the posterior chain, and then and then one to two isolation. And then again, there is the daily ab exercises where you do four sets of 25 reps, which I suppose means that you're not going to really use any weight because, well, that's 25 reps. So that's a lot and there's no real place for evolution. So 
I think the philosophy here is just train your abs and you'll see them. And it's true that you will see them if you do that. But I think we could slash the volume in half for the abs and just do three sets of 8 to 12 with actual progressive overload in place. And that would be much better. And this also applies to the rest of the program because it is my one big criticism for it. It's way too much. We could slash 30 to 40% of the volume and the result you would get would be similar. But I understand it's also part of the appeal because I read many reviews of this program for this video and people say, well, it's super hard, but it really forced myself to go through it and I've seen amazing results. The issue is that I've also noticed that these people tend to also be the type that run this program for eight weeks and then they quit and they stop lifting, which is perfectly logical. This is not sustainable. To me, a good program should be something that you can run for months because it keeps you engaged and it keeps you fresh. This is designed to burn you out because it's a journey through hell. Journey through hell designed by someone who was enhanced. Arnold loved this volume. He was famous for being a volume junkie. He would train two to three times a day, twice a day. I don't think that is possible for someone who is not getting some extra help from substances. As a natural lifter, the credo is do as little as possible to get back as much as possible because we simply don't have the same recovery ability. So for us, that is just junk volume and junk volume is a waste of time. And it also is fatiguing for no reason whatsoever. So overall, unsurprisingly, this is not a program that I would recommend, but is it the worst program I've ever seen? Heck no. Modern bodybuilders come up with much worse than this. There are actually a few things that can be salvaged from this program. That is, if you don't take into account the philosophy that is attached to it, and that leads us to the last part, the one where I'm going to be the most critical because if you have run this program, you know that Arnold also used intensity techniques to quote unquote shock the muscle and help with muscle growth. And these are threefold. The number one is the one to 10 method. I quote, after a warm up set, find a weight you're only able to get for one rep. After you perform that one rep, take enough weight off to perform two reps. From there, do the same for three reps, four reps, five reps, all the way down to 10 reps. Let me be clear, this method is really hard and it's really brutal and it's going to make you feel your muscle, but it's also horrible for hypertrophy. Why? No rest between sets. So whatever performance you're going to have on these reps is not going to be really relevant to the amount of intensity you could put in because you're not rested. That should be obvious. Two, you start with a one rep max, which is not good because it's a one rep max. It's no matter how much you push on this one rep, it's still just one rep volume wise. So this is not going to get you the results that you want. And then you param it down to two, three, four. Why not just do a six by 10 right off the bat? That would be much faster, much better volume and much more balanced intensity wise. This is all over the place. This is typically the type of thing that you can do once in a blue moon and once in a blue moon means once every six months for the heck of it for fun. But if it becomes a recurrent part of your intensity techniques, it's going to shoot you in the foot because the risk of injury is also naturally very high. You start with a one rep max that maximally stretches and targets and, and fatigues the tendons and the structure. And then you're going to go down to a 10 rep max. So it's really playing Russian roulette. This is not good. Then you have the stripping method, also known as the shocking principle. Immediately after your final work set, take some weight off and get five to 10 reps. Then with no rest, keep repeating, reducing your weight until you're down to the bar, repping that for 20 reps. Self-explanatory as well, no rest in between the sets. So that's already garbage. And two, the issue here is that, yeah, you're going to get a ton of volume from it, from this, but is it good volume? The reason why you're going to go to failure is because the muscle is tired. So this is junk volume 101. Whatever you get after that first set, is tacked on for real, no real purpose whatsoever. It's just for the sake of feeling the fatigue in your muscle, but it's more of a psychological thing. In terms of physiology, this is not what you seek for hypertrophy. And then there is the max effort method where you pick one exercise and you see what you can do for one rep max. And to get there, you just power it up. So you do 25 reps, then 20, then 15, then 10, then eight, then five, then three, then one, then one, then one. Again, it's ends up with a one rep max at the point where you're already almost maximally fatigued. So there's no point. One rep max is already pointless for hypertrophy. 
all of this sadly stems from the idea that the muscle needs to be shocked. Like you have to throw your muscle, like uh, what, what do they say in English? A boomerang or whatever. You have to throw a wrench in the entire system to confuse the muscle into growth. Your muscle has been designed to grow. That is the function of a muscle. It does two things. It moves a lever and it's designed to strengthen if that lever is challenged for us to make sure the lever doesn't break. Th that is the human body 101. Once you understand this, you also understand that doing all of these weird strategies is actually counterintuitive and counterproductive. If you want to use intensity techniques, that is fine, but always make sure they're put at the service of a quality set. So to contrast these shocking techniques, let me present to you mine. I personally use three intensity techniques. Three, I focus on quality sets. Then what I do is, if I want to do additional reps, I'm going to do rest pose. So if I get 10 reps with a weight and I go to failure on the 10th, I'm going to take 30 seconds and I'm going to get additional reps. These reps are going to be very high quality because I'm still very fatigued and they're still used with a weight that is highly challenging. That is my favorite intensity technique and it's the one that you really should be using on every movement that allows you to rest at the top. Any presses on the Smith, any isolation movement for the biceps, any isolation movement on cables, do rest pose. You will see a big increase in muscle mass and also in progressive overload because this is going to allow you to progress very fast. If you plateau, let's say you've been plateauing on lateral raises for the past three weeks with the same weight, do this. Let's say you want to get 15 reps and you keep plateauing at 10. Get 10, rest 30 seconds and then go for some more. You'll be able to get an extra five, then go up in weight. Suddenly the plateau has been shattered. You're still getting those reps. You're still moving the weight, you're not cheating. This is an actual good intensity technique. The second one I like to use is, is drop sets, but not an artificial drop set. I never pick a weight and then say, okay, at this point I stop and I lower the weight for no reason. No, I do it to be able to extend the set, the quality of the set. So let's say I do tricep extensions on the cable machine and I want 15 reps and I hit hard failure at 10 and rest pose is not allowing me to get any more with that weight. I take the pin, up one, I reduce it by five or 10 pounds and I finish my set like this. These reps are yes, not as intense than the previous ones with the, the higher weight, but they're still very close to failure. And so that is going to allow me to bridge that volume gap and it's going to allow me to break that plateau. And then the last technique is a back off set. If you are using a very high weight for two sets and you want a third set, but you can no longer use that weight and no intensity technique can be applied to it because you can no longer move it within the rep range, that is perfectly fine. Reduce the weight by a fraction. It's still very close to failure and you're still getting very high quality volume. Do you see what all of these methods have in common? They're all at the service of the quality set. They all add to the quality set, they never replace it. Because the goal always in bodybuilding is progression. It's to move forward. It's to keep getting more volume and to keep also upping the weight. Because now we know that the muscle is challenged, the muscle is growing. Which also leads to the secondary application to shocking the muscle. Because it's not just the fact that the program has these techniques put in place. It's also the fact that Arnold, for example, has you do low bench, high bench, medium bench with the, mod the modification of the incline of the bench rotating every single week. And that looks like a good idea to shock the muscle, but the issue is that it's also horrible for specificity. Because, well, yeah, it's technically a movement for the same muscle group, you will find and you might find that when you come back to a different degree or angle, now you've regressed and you think, what the fuck? Well, that's why. It's because this attempt to shocking the muscle actually took away from the continuity of your training. So instead, how about doing variations? You can have a low incline and a high incline bench press with a barbell and the two can co a bit. They don't need to come in and out of the program. They can literally be at the same spot of the program and on a given day you do one or the other. That way you know that every single week or every like every 72 hours you're going to get your shit in. You're going to keep your neurological adaptation high and you're never going to regress on this. The more you progress, the less relevant it becomes because the more adapted you are. But for a novice, I have seen that happen. This idea that you need a gazillion variation like in this program, nonsense. Pick one movement, when that movement stalls, 
had a variation, milk these two. You can make gains for a year with two variations, then add a third, etc., etc. You will eventually reach a, mo a, a moment, a peak, where the vortex can no longer expand, where adding movements is going to just be detrimental because now you have enough to keep progressing forever, which is a video I've already made. It is the unlimited hypertrophy method. I'm going to put it in the description for you guys. Check it out. It's simple as fuck. Bodybuilding progression is simple. The difficult part is getting to the gym every single day and actually sticking to it. And that is the final part of this shock the muscle thing I want to talk about. The notion that many people follow this advice, not because they know it's good for hypertrophy, but because it's good for their boredom. They get bored. You get bored. You program up all the time. You take exercises out of your program. You're still progressing on. Why? Because you want novelty. This is an issue. Because keep in mind that when you replace exercises and you do something new, sure, you progress super fast on that exercise, not because you're growing, but because you're adapting to the exercise. Once you start to plateau and you start to struggle for these reps, that is when growth is occurring. So if every single time an exercise slows down, you take it out and you replace it with a new, congratulations, you have found a way to not shock the muscle. You have found a way to keep the muscle small, to keep the muscle always unchallenged. And the worst part is that your body is going to thank you for it because your body is going to get sore. We all know that. If tomorrow I completely change my squat patterns and I do a brand new type, oh, my quads are going to be sore, my glutes are going to be sore. Am I progressing? Is this because I'm progressing? No, it's because the body is not used to it. Being sore just shows that you're not adapted to the movement, that you struggle to recover. It's not a sign of progression. It can be sometimes, let's say you do Romanian deadlifts and you've been doing them for years. I have. I still get sore from the motherfuckers. That to me shows that this is putting some serious mass on my, mass on my posterior chain, but that is because it's been there for a while. So if there is a movement that you love a lot because it makes you sore consistently, then by all means, stick to it because it's most likely working. But if you're addicted to the soreness and you cycle movements to chase that soreness, you are going to essentially sabotage your gains. So if there's really one big critique I would have for Arnold, it's his training philosophy, which isn't surprising because we know that the man spoke a lot of shit. It's very possible that all of the things about the pump being better than coming and shocking the muscle, he could have just said these things because they sound cool. Because he was on camera and he wanted to show off or say something that would actually stick. And it managed to. It stuck. Because Arnold is a charismatic son of a bitch. It's why he became a politician. But here's the thing. Because of that, he also became mystified in the mind of many people who took his word for granted, which also led to the complete opposite phenomenon of people who then use him as an easy clickbait factory where they're going to start to propagate nonsense ideas about training technique, for example, that they're going to then feed to you. Meaning that the real moral of this entire video and story is use your brain. Stop blindly following people just because you like them or because they're big or because they're charismatic. And also, don't just blindly fall for the people that attack them. Instead, think logically. Does it make sense that a cable rule should be done with frozen shoulders? No. Does it make sense that a program for novices should have 30 fucking sets for chest? No. Does it make sense that you would need, for example, to replace movements every week to make progress? No. Once you reach that level of understanding, which is available for 100% of people, we all have a brain, then your fitness journey is going to become much easier. And that is going to conclude this video. It was quite enjoyable for me to make. Let me know in the comments what you think. If there are other mythified creatures of fitness you would want me to talk about, I would be happy to do that. And as always, if you enjoy my work, please remember to support the page on Coffee. It is the first link in the description. Pledging only $3 a month makes a world of difference for me because it allows me to keep making videos. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.